Good afternoon and welcome to the Limb Preservation Symposium 2021 with Ergo Medical. We are going to be uh, talking with an esteemed group of uh, speakers and clinicians about leading through clinical evidence to face the current and rising challenges of DFU management in pandemic times and after. Let me introduce you the uh, panelists today. Our first is Professor Michael Edmonds, who is, runs the Diabetic Foot Clinic at King's College Hospital in London. Our second speaker is Professor Luis Lazaro Martinez, and he heads the Diabetic Foot Unit at San Carlos Teaching Hospital in Madrid, Spain. He is also the president of DFoot International. And lastly is me. I'm Perry Meyer. I'm the director of the, Medic uh, of the Meyer Institute, a center of excellence dedicated to the treatment of the diabetic foot. And I'd like to um, go over our agenda. We're going to first talk about current and rising key challenges in DFU management, vascular outcomes of uh, TLC and OSF in the management of diabetic foot, and a short Canadian experience, love in the time of COVID. It's kind of a love story. Not exactly, but it's interesting. And then at the end, we will hopefully have a considerable amount of time to have a roundtable discussion the, to look at the impact of COVID on DFU patients and the clinicians um, and uh, the, what we've learned to move forward in the future. Let me introduce you. Our first speaker is Professor Michael Edmonds from King's College Hospital in London. Professor Edmonds. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be with you this afternoon. Even in pandemic times, diabetes is a global emergency. The number of people with diabetes worldwide and per region is increasing markedly. Uh, and you can see these figures from 2017 to 2045. For example, uh, the numbers will increase by 35% uh, in top left-hand corner in the North America and the Caribbean. Foot ulceration remains the most common and severe pattern of diabetic complications. 5% of patients with diabetes have a history of foot ulceration and there is a greater than 25% cumulative lifetime incidence. The clinical burden is immense. 84% of amputations are associated with ulcers. Amputation is one of the most feared complications of diabetes. And every 20 seconds in the world, someone loses a leg due to diabetes. And indeed, the economic burden is, in, is great. Uh, these are figures showing the cost of foot ulceration and amputation in people with diabetes in England from 214 to 215. And you can see on the right of the screen, the cost was between 837 and 962 million pounds, representing 0.8 to 0.9 percent of the country's NHS budget, more than the combined cost of breast, prostate and lung cancers. 90 percent of the expenditure was related to ulceration and 60 percent of that for care in community, outpatient and primary settings. So we have to achieve optimum foot ulcer management. And to do this, we have to understand the pathogenesis of diabetic foot ulceration, make a basic classification and staging of the foot, heal the uncomplicated ulcer quickly, and refer the complicated and severely complicated ulcer for specialist management as soon as possible. As to the pathogenesis, there are three great pathologies, primary neuropathy and ischemia, the secondary infection. But in a practical clinical approach, we can classify the diabetic foot into the neuropathic foot, where neuropathy predominates, and the neuroischemic foot, where both neuropathy and ischemia uh, occur. The natural history of these can be very aggressive. And according to the simple staging system, this can go from normal, high risk, ulcerated, infected, and necrotic. Uh, this shows the high-risk stage, neuropathic and neuroischemic, where the foot is intact, but uh, ulceration can quickly develop, uh, and this is shown on, on the left of the neuropathic with a plantar ulcer, and on the right with a marginal ulcer. 
These are susceptible to infection, uh, as you can see from the cellulitis, and then this can lead to necrosis, severe complicated foot. The natural history goes rapidly out of control. So to restore control uh, and to avoid amputation, we've got to get control of the wound, get control of mechanical factors, vascular factors, and achieve infection control, metabolic control, and educational control. No one discipline can achieve this. Uh, comprising podiatrist, nurse, surgeon, uh, vascular, orthopedic, plastic, interventional radiologist, orthotist, or diabetologist. And to achieve uh, this control, the multidisciplinary foot team must work uh, in a particular focus in the diabetic foot clinic, where therapy can be coordinated into an integrated service. And there must be rapid access to care through a patient-friendly pathway. This is the diabetic foot clinic and the multidisciplinary foot team in this clinic uh, sets out to heal ulcers with plasters and orthotics, accept emergency referrals, uh, link in with vast diabetic foot clinics, orthopedic diabetic foot clinics, uh, provide an outpatient antibiotic service, debridement of minor surgery, post-operative reviews and follow-ups, charco foot clinics, research, and coordination of primary and secondary care. It's very important for the diabetic foot clinic to have strong the community, and this may be with the, the relative and care worker, healthcare workers and residential homes, community podiatrists, community nurse, general practitioner. But overall, the patient is in the, in the center, and there must be a patient-friendly pathway uh, with open access service to see emergency cases on the same day or within 24 hours, referrals from all healthcare professionals, general practitioners, community podiatrists, community nurses, and referrals uh, from patients. So how does it all work? This is the high-risk foot, where the aim is to recognize the high-risk state early and management the risk uh, and prevent the development of diabetic foot ulcers. One must uh, identify the two major risk factors, loss of protective sensation due to neuropathy and peripheral arterial disease. One can uh, identify the loss of protective sensation using the uh, monofilament shown in the left-hand corner. Uh, the uh, sites for examination are the first toe, the first metatarsal head, and the fifth metatarsal head. Uh, uh, the um, is put perpendicularly to the foot, and protective sensation is present at each site if the patient correctly answers two out of three applications, absent with two out of three incorrect answers. And peripheral arterial disease is uh, identified by the absence of the two foot pulses, the dorsalis pedis artery on the dorsum and the posterior tibial artery uh, behind uh, the medial malleolus. Uh, having performed these uh, examinations, it's fine and stratify uh, the risk level. Uh, so this could be a very low where there is no loss of protective sensation and, and no peripheral arterial disease uh, low, where there is one of or the other, and the patient should be seen that once every six or 12 months, the medium risk may, uh, may be all present. And there we have uh, loss of both protective sensation and PAD, or loss of protective uh, with foot deformity, or PAD with foot deformity. And these patients should be seen once every three to six months. And finally, there is the ulcer risk set at high, where there is either loss of protective sensation or PAD, and uh, uh, one of the following, history of a foot ulcer, lower extremity amputation, uh, or end-stage renal disease. And these patients need really close follow-up uh, within a multidisciplinary team. Further details can be seen on the website, Save Feet and Save Life. Uh, now, despite all that surveillance, foot problems will develop. And uh, it is important that the patient presents very early. Uh, we've derived this uh, acronym, ACT NOW, for patients to pick up these problems and have confidence to seek help. So A is for accident to the foot, C for change 
in colour or shape, T for temperature change, N for new pain, O for oozing, and W for wound. The patients may present initially with uh, the uncomplicated ulcer seen here in neuropathic and the, uh, the neuro ischemic foot. And the objectives uh, at this time are to heal ulcers as quickly as possible and avoid complications. Uh, there has been developed a, a fast track pathway for treating diabetic foot ulceration during COVID-19 and beyond. This is a panoramic view that shows the three channels uh, on the left, the uncomplicated ulcer in green, uh, the complicated ulcer in the middle in brown, and the severely complicated ulcer uh, in red. Uh, the initial examination um, is uh, the first assessment, and uh, this is a holistic approach, looking at the medical history, uh, clinical examination, and assessing the biology of the wound and also looking at the psychosocial context of the patient, treating and assessing the comorbidities, heart failure, end-stage renal failure and depression, and also investigation for the signs and symptoms of COVID-19 infection. At this stage, we are looking at the uncomplicated ulcer uh, as recognized by presence of pulses and no signs of infection. Uh, this can be managed in the community uh, with standard of care and followed up in the community uh, with uh, assistance from the specialized diabetic foot service. And this can be either face-to-face uh, -face or, or telemedicine. And uh, the treatment continues in the community of a stable foot ulcer until healing. Uh, there is a tool book box for DFU management in primary care uh, derived uh, by DFOOT uh, and this comprises diabetes metabolic control, looking at HbA1c and glycemia, vascular status, uh, making sure the patient is not going ischemic, looking for cyanosis in the code foot, treat the comorbidities, kidney, cardiovascular, obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia, uh, the foot should go, undergo debridement, preferably sharp surgical, uh, avoid common disinfectants and self-made solutions, rule out infection. Uh, if you probe through the ulcer to the bone, this may suggest osteomyelitis, look out for pain, tenderness, local warmth, cellulitis, uh, and, and other uh, factors such as friable wound tissue, exudate increase. These are the local factors and systemic factors, maybe fever, anorexia, uh, but they may not be present because of neuropathy. Uh, offloading is important uh, of the ulcer so that you can keep the patient uh, active um, and particularly accommodate the deformities, bone prominences, rigid foot and charco foot. Uh, dressing selection is also vital. Uh, if there is biofilm and non-controlled bacterial load, consider an antimicrobial dressing. Otherwise, uh, there is good evidence now that sucrose octosulfate, TLC, uh, NOSF, uh, nano oligosaccharide saccharide factor, impregnated dressing, um, is particularly in the neuroschemic foot from day naught, and for non-improved ulcers, Otherwise, when there's been less than 30% improvement after two weeks. The basic principle from the international consensus, the non-complicated DFU uh, select dressing according to the basis of exudate, control, comfort, and cost. Uh, while once keeping surveillance, always be aware of the alarm signs of infection, which I've mentioned to you uh, uh, before, and also ischemia, necrosis of the edge, cyanosis, and, and less uh, progress uh, of the wound. Uh, so it's very important to get the ulcer healed before these alarming features develop. And we now have evidence that we can reduce healing time with TLC NOSF healing matrix, otherwise known as Ergo Start. More patients were healed in the, the groundbreaking Explorer study and sooner. The well, sooner TLC is implemented, the better the outcomes for the patients. Mm -hmm. The Explorer study is going to be uh, described in detail in the next talk. I would just simply concentrate on the headlines. Uh, 
TLC significantly increased the rate of complete DFU womb closure versus neutral dressings. The time to womb closure was 60 days sooner with TLC NSOF. And the sooner TLC NSOF is used, the better the patient outcomes, particularly for ulcer duration less than two months. You can see a 30% difference in healing rate. It's simple to use from day one to complete healing. It's reliable and it's cost effective and recommended by international guidelines. Uh, if uh, one fails to heal the ulcer, then we have a complicated or severely complicated ulcer. The objective there is to save the foot and avoid amputation with referral uh, to multidisciplinary foot teams. And here we have the, the second and third channels, uh, particularly the, the second channel, the complicated DFU, uh, where the uh, pulses are absent and there are signs of infection. The ulcer is uh, unstable, and this needs early referral to specialized diabetic foot service. Uh, within 48 to 72 hours to control the infection, assess the ischemia, uh, achieve stability of the ulcer. If one can't just do that, then uh, with persisting, in, persisting infection, the patient uh, has then got a severely complicated foot ulcer. Urgent hospitalization is needed for early foot surgery and early revascularization. Uh, and these are, are, are the two very important pathways uh, of, of, to treat the complicated ulcer. This overall uh, protocol and setup, I think, has uh, helped uh, in UK, for example, in, in the treatment of the foot in the COVID-19 pandemic. Early on, uh, our National Health Service uh, said in a clinical guide for the management of acute diabetes patients, Multidisciplinary diabetic foot services should stay open and may need to continue at full capacity. Of course, there was a, 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 a change from uh, the, the emphasis uh, for the foot from hospital care, from hospital inpatients and hospital outpatients to community clinics and patients' homes and nursing homes. And you can see here uh, the, the, the spot statistics on the left face-to-face -face consultations for pre-COVID, 40 a day, came down to 15 a day. Telephone consultations are very low before pre-COVID and, and up to six, seven a day uh, during COVID. Uh, so uh, in transferring from community to foot clinic, the professionals in the foot clinic uh, assisted the community with one-to-one -one advice, Microsoft Teams meetings, Pando platforms, that's the NHS WhatsApp, telephone and video. And uh, although amputations have been reported in increased numbers, uh, in, in our clinic, we did not see increased major amputations. Nine and nine, two and two twenty. Perhaps a trend towards more uh, proximal amputations with increased thrombosis for the AKA, uh, two of them COVID uh, positive. So in summary, uh, in conclusion, uh, up until recently, the diabetic foot has defeated every healthcare in system in the world. The diabetic foot is complex, it is costly, but it's conquerable, and ulcers can be healed and amputations prevented. Thank you very much. So welcome everyone, and thanks for the kind invitation to Ulgo for the Lean Preservation Symposium 2021. I'm going to talk about vascular outcomes of TLC and OS of the management of the diabetes foot. So firstly, I would like to introduce you what is the standard of case of diabetes foot ulcer. And especially, I would like to remind that diabetes foot ulcer is not just an ulcer, it's a disease. And is in this consideration, it's very important to take in, in mind that it's very, very important to overcome the uploading of the ulcer, the restoration of the tissue perfusion, the treatment of infection, the metabolic control and treatment of comorbidities of the diabetes, and of course, the local ulcer care. But mainly I would like to remind that is the main principles of the management of local care in diabetes foot ulcer. And I would like to remind, this is the title for the article for the manuscript for a very good friend of mine. This is Dr. David Ashton from USA. 
and this is the in the in this article he described in his title that is not what you put on but what you take off and this is very very true and especially this is important things the um, focusing in the deprivation and of clothing when you are treating diabetic foot ulcer but it is true especially when you are treating pure neuropathic diabetic foot but what is the problem now the main issue that we are have to overcome currently is that the uh, uh, especially in United States and uh, I think in Canada and, and, and too in Europe, in Europe, the majority of the patients suffer from nerve ischemic uh, diabetes foot ulcer. I can say that approximately between 60 or 70 of our patients suffer from a nerve ischemic diabetes foot ulcer. And in this condition, this nerve ischemic diabetes foot ulcer has a deleterious impact in the ulcer, especially because the ischemia not only reduce the, the probability of healing, but also increase the levels of antibody of MMP, the metal proteinases, this is an infip that has a uh, uh, worse impact in the healing of the allergic food ulcer. And two, uh, uh, additionally, we can say that uh, in this kind of patient, the neuropathy, and especially the autonomic neuropathy, can also uh, have an impact in the um, uh, perfusion and then in the vascularization of the distal part of the foot, and especially because the microfibrillation is impairing in this kind of patient. So, in the end, we, we have a patient with a problem with the healing, and we have a patient who has some difficulties to achieve the ulcer healing. So, and in this context, Urgo developed the TLC NOSF uh, dressing. And based on one of mechanism on action and specifically focusing in the reduction of this enzyme, the reduction of NMP. And one hypothesis is that due to this reduction, is probably that it can help in the neoangiogenesis of the new vessels in the ulcer and, is, and at the end in the uh, growing of the new granulation tissue and at the end in the reduction of the healing time. So basically, uh, following this hypothesis, Urgo proposed this kind of a study. This is an RCT that's underwent in uh, Europe. Uh, this is called Explorer RCT and is um, developing in five countries in Europe, Germany, Italy, France, United Kingdom, and Spain. And basically is focusing in analyze what's in the impact or what is the effect of passing treating with the TLC NOSF uh, comparing with uh, another group of passing with that treating with a neutral dressing. So basically the protocol of the RCT is uh, 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 focusing in passing with neuroischemic ulcer. And after uh, identify this passing with neuroischemic ulcer, the, the patient are following in a running period. If after this running period, the, the patient reduce less than 30% of the area of the uh, ulcer, of the, of the area of the wound ulcer is included in the study. And after this running period, the, uh, the, uh, the patient included in the study are not only neuroischemic, but neuroischemic, but two patients with a poor outcome after the follow-up period. And after these two weeks, the patients are allocated in two groups, one group for an intervention group with passing with TLC and OSF, and the other passing with neutral um, uh, dressing, and the patients are following during the 20 weeks. So after this 20 weeks, we have the results or the main results of this study. And we uh, demonstrate that patients who receive the treatment with the TLC and OSF dressing achieve 60% more patient uh, of healing. And not only um, is, is, the, is has been demonstrated a benefit in the rate of patient healing, that is demonstrated and a reduction of the healing time. And according to this, we, uh, we demonstrate that the patient who received this kind of treatment reduced the healing of time almost two months, six days. And two, we demonstrate that especially the patient who has a dura um, um, duration time 
of the after less than two months has a higher rate of healing comparing to those patients who have a long duration time. So in summary, we can say that the, this kind of treatment is good in every group of patients, but even is better when you are using in a patient with a less uh, duration time. So the conclusion we can say that the sooner the better. When you are using this dressing, the sooner you can get the better outcome of the patient. So uh, according with this result, uh, uh, the, um, it has been including in the last international guideline uh, on diabetes food, the international guideline that is produced by the International Working Group Diabetes Food, it has been including the recommendation to use this kind of tracing for treating patients with neuroischemic non-infecting diabetic food as a part of the best standard of care. And it's important to remind that this is the first time ever that addressing is recommended by the International Working Group Diabetes Food for the treatment of diabetic food ulcer. But what is important in this lecture too, we are looking into the vascular status of patients included of explorer RCT. So according with the decision tree, this is the decision tree for inclusion passing in the study. And you can see how the patient are including when the patient has less than 0.9 toe brachial pressure in this. And according on this, the patient has to be an 0.7, less than 0.7 systolic toe blood pressure and up to 50 millimeters of mercury in, in, in the toe uh, low blood pressure. So this is in, in summary, the definition of the neuroischemic patient. So according with this characteristic, these features of the patient, you can see here the comparison between the control group and the TLC NOS group. And you can see how the most of the patient uh, has a peripheral arterial disease confirmed by the anchor brachial index. And another important thing is that the both groups present a comparable status of the peripheral arterial disease with the same degree of arterial involvement. You can see here the comparison between the control, the total, and the ultra star patient comparing with the mild and the moderate ischemia. And the more important thing is that when you are, when we are analyzing or we were analyzing the result between the patient with moderate ischemia and the mild ischemia, the result at the sale, at equal, and at core condensate. You can see here how is the difference between the patient with moderate ischemia and the mild ischemia. Of course, the patient with mild ischemia has a higher difference. It's around 74% uh, higher in comparing with the control group. And in passing with the moderate ischemia is up to uh, 36% comparing the passing in the control group. But in summary, we can say that this kind of tracing is working well in passing both with moderate and the mild ischemia. And this uh, hypothesis has been confirmed in our last pilot study that we have published in the International Journal of Lower Extremity Bones, comparing this, the, the level of transcutaneous oxygen pressure in patient before and after to treat this kind of dressing. And basically, this study, including passing in both groups, including passing treating with TLC NOS dressing, and we have the more or less the, the same uh, uh, corpular rest result comparing with the explorer study. That means with a significant boom side decreasing at four weeks with significant boot improving and with a healing medial time of eight weeks. But the more important thing is that the main outcome of this pilot study demonstrates that the majority of the patients, including in the study, increase the level of the oxygenation after the treatment. That means that comparing the, the status of the patient before the treatment and after the treatment, this patient has a significant increase in the level of the TCPO2 and in the level of the oxygenation, transcutaneous oxygen in the patients who are treating with this kind of patient. So that means that in the summary, the patients are improving the vascular status and the local state and then improving the microcirculation 
probably because the reduction of the MMP, that is the main option of this kind of tracing. And you can see here several clinical case studies. This is a patient with a neuroischemic uh, diabetic foot ulcer. And you can see how on the starting of the treatment, the patient has the 100% of the loud tissue very adherent. And you can see how the patient, when we are starting with the use of the Ugostat dressing at, well, uh, at 12 weeks, you can see how the patient is showing a very good granulation tissue. And at the end, the patient is healing in week 18. So uh, the result of the past of, of, of this um, patient demonstrates the effect of this dressing. This is another kind of patient. This, in this case, is with a patient with a ischemic ulcer, with a necrotic, and after revascularization, this is the patient after revascularization and after the use of a negative uh, pressure. And we began with the use of the Urgostar, and you can see how the patient achieved almost the healing in which eight after the revascularization and after a surgical deployment of the previous ulcer. And you can see here, the chief of the ulcer in week 12. And this is another uh, example. It's a patient with a neuropathic ulcer with an, only one week uh, on time of duration of the ulcer. And you can see here how we can achieve the healing of the ulcer in only eight weeks. So what this means. So it's very important, for instance, when you are treating this kind of patient with a short term outcome, with a, uh, um, uh, with a, with a uh, less duration time, you can approximately achieve an ulcer healing approximately within eight weeks. And we, when you, you start the patient in a bad condition of the boom breath, especially passing with necrotic and passing with the slough tissue, and especially in passing with neuroischemic, with uh, um, uh, a long duration time, you can achieve a boom per, boom bed preparation after seat of a week, and probably you can achieve an ulcer healing after four or six weeks. That means approximately a medium on time between 12 and 14 weeks. So this is a very important demonstration that is according to different ulcer features, you can expect different uh, outcomes. So in conclusion, we can say that the TLC NOSF dressing is recommended by the International Working Group Diabetic Food Guideline in the treatment of neuroischemic diabetic food ulcer. And according with our result, the sooner the better, that means that the sooner you start to treat the patient, the better outcome you can, you, you can get with the, with the ulcer. And especially this is our recommendation and a special recommendation with patients with neuroischemic when sometimes it's very difficult to expect that the patient has a very good boom bed preparation, and this boom bed preparation is coming after the use of the dressing. This is a very important recommendation. Important half-life in vascular outcomes. The vascular respiratory outcomes demonstrate that this uh, dressing is even working in patients who has some mild and moderate ischemia and even is working on, on a patient um, before and after revascularization. Important demonstration in, in our pilot study is the TCPO2 result that demonstrate that the ulcer uh, in, uh, of the passing better state is increasing the oxygenation after the use of this kind of tracing. That is a demonstration. This is important message, don't wait to revascularization because you can start before and after revascularization because, because if you are starting to treat the patient, you can get a better boom bed preparation despite the level of vascular status of the patient. And at the end, very important, according with the clinical features and the vascular status, you can get different expectations concerning the time to heal it. But at the end, remember that always using a dressing that is working with the level of the metal proteinesis that is working in the boom bed preparation is always a very good option to get a very good outcome in passing with diabetic foot ash. So thank you very much for your attention. My name is uh, Dr. Perry Meyer. And uh, as I said, I'm the medical director of the Meyer Institute. It's a, a diabetic wound center here in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. And today I'm gonna to be talking about love in the time of COVID, a Canadian experience. And it's an odd story, but it is an example of how COVID um, 
uh, affected our practice. I'd like to bring you to uh, a quote from the book of Love in the Time of Cholera um, by Gabriel Marque Mar Marquez. Um, Wisdom comes to us when it can no longer do any good. And hopefully um, in, during this year of pandemic, um, the trying times have allowed us not to react so much as to respond. And that has become hard because it's all new to us. But I think uh, hopefully we will demonstrate here uh, amongst uh, Professor Edmonds and um, uh, Jose Luis Lazaro Martinez, what we have done in our centers to accommodate uh, the restrictions and the, um, the impairment or the effect on our patients and how to manipulate that and turn it around positively. So here at the Meyer Institute, our numbers have changed and um, we see a lot of patient visits uh, in a year. Um, in 2019, prior to the pandemic, we, were, we had seen uh, 17,000 uh, over patient visits as compared to the pandemic year where we dropped down about 10% to 15,000 over. Um, however, our acuity rose dramatically. And so where we were doing about 25% preventative care, now we are doing uh, far less and 88% of our uh, patient visits are for wound care alone, not, only, not the preventative stuff. Um, we did uh, significantly more toe amputations, um, but they weren't the biggest uh, increase in our procedures. Um, med head resections, ray resections, um, our Charcot count went up uh, substantially. We already see quite a number of new Charcot cases, but it went up dramatically too. Um, we sent out 525 vascular referrals um, during the pandemic year, as opposed to 401 in the previous year. A lot of referrals as um, the, our two speakers have, you know, very brilliantly laid out vascular support is critical. And when revascularization is delayed, uh, we lose tissue. So this is very important. But the biggest, uh, the biggest um, and the most dramatic increase in our uh, acuity came and was demonstrated by the forefoot amputations that occurred here. And although we did uh, 30 over in the previous year, they jumped up by 10. And, and th this sounds like a small number, but here in an outpatient center, it's a big deal. These are not um, surgeries that I particularly uh, relish or look forward to. The others we do, uh, you know, we've done so many of them that it becomes second nature. This particular is um, forefoot amputations are a result of um, poor access to the hospital during pandemic because we didn't have the support in the hospital that we needed to deal with these patients. And I'm going to um, show you um, and describe a case history of one particular patient that was uh, quite dramatic. So our clinic is, um, uh, it's a multidisciplinary team, but we use a m virtual multidisciplinary team. Um, unlike my, my esteemed colleagues who have uh, specialists that are there physically in, in the uh, hospital, but we do not. And uh, we need to rely on a virtual team of which we develop relationships with and they, we can rely on them to give us uh, assistance and guidance at the moment. And it's no good to have a call back. They take our calls um, when we call them and that's really helpful. So again, it's the same group, vascular surgeons, infectious disease, endocrinology, ortho, dermatology, plastics, and um, in our center, we have uh, very, very highly skilled nurses who probably uh, from a wound perspective are, there, there are not too many in Canada, or even in North America that are rival them in their surgical skills. Uh, we run a O&P department uh, with a, uh, a team orthotist and prosthetist who fabricates uh, custom braces, prosthetic limbs, shoes, orthotics, et cetera. And then we have a research coordinator. Now the clinic layout um, is an open concept uh, with six treatment bays. This allows for improved workflow. Uh, nursing staff are very, very good at multitasking, which is critical when you're running a very busy clinic like this. Um, I am aware in the layout, and you'll see uh, the layout allows for me to keep um, an eye on my finger on the pulse of uh, the whole clinic at once. We are paperless here. We don't, paper would slow us down considerably. 
And all of the treatment is done here in the, in the outpatient setting in the treatment rooms that we'll show you in a second. Each treatment room is exactly the same setup so that we know that everything is the same and when we go looking for it, it's gonna be there. And this allows, again, me to see all of the patients and um, give them the time that they need. So when I thought about designing the place, putting rooms in would slow things up and that's not okay. And the overall effect is efficient scalability and scalability is important because as we all know, the numbers are not decreasing uh, when it comes to diabetic uh, wound patients. So this is our reception area, it's quite large and um, this is important during these times, we've rearranged the seating to space out everybody so that we can sit them down six feet apart. And that's doable here in our center. However, in other centers where the waiting room is small, um, that doesn't work so well and flow is altered. Um, this is our uh, clinic setup. And as you can see, um, there are open bays. We're divided by three quarter walls. It works for us, but it gives us um, sort of a theater in the round and allows um, all of the players, nurses and me to uh, multitask and keep our eye on multiple patients at the same time. So um, this is a love story. It's a case series of um, uh, limb salvage. Um, it's a 50 year old, 50 year old, uh, 54 year old um, man who was diabetic with on chronic kidney uh, dialysis, um, who presented in late 2019 with a gangrenous first digit that required amputation. We did that, the incision healed, but in early 2020, he developed a transfer ulcer on the second digit and then um, developed an acute limb required uh, revascularization. Now this was just before the shutdown here in March and it, it made for difficult times and very anxious times. Um, so this is uh, in August of 2019, he banged his toe. It set off a microvascular uh, ischemic uh, process that we all know very well led to gangrene. And um, we amputated the digit, turned out very nicely. But as you can see in the second picture here on the right, um, you can see that second toe is quite um, hyperflexed. And this is the motor neuropathy of diabetes, but that, toe was already got my attention and I was a bit worried about it but he did really well. So um, this lasted for almost a year and but in March um, the microvascular um, uh, ischemia swept through his lesser digits as a result of that second digit that hyperflex second digit getting a wound on the tip. So this required a four foot amputation. This was now just before um, shutdown and he just squeaked in revascularization just before the shutdown, which if we didn't get that, he would have lost his leg for sure. Instead, he was revascularized and we did a four foot amputation, sewed him up April 28, uh, 2020. And this is the love story part of this uh, presentation. On this day, if you can believe it, it was this couple's 25th wedding anniversary and his wife's birthday. And although it was a, not a great day, it was a great day for him and his family because we were able to save his leg. Now, the second part of the story is that he did really well for the better part of a year, but in February, on the left foot, he knocked off his toenail. And that set off yet another microvascular shutdown, which then swept through his foot and required that almost to the day, 20 days less, we did a four foot amputation on his other foot. And on April 19th, just a, a few days ago, we saw him and uh, it was healing well. We have a little bit of a issue on the lateral border, but I think that that will be fine. So this is a terrible uh, outcome and um, a, a terrible occurrence with a pretty good outcome. But again, as we know, um, this gentleman will be at risk uh, for the rest of his life. And uh, we need to follow him very, very closely. So parting thoughts. COVID has forced us to look inward to understand human behavior better. And this, I know that our, my, my colleagues have experienced this, that there is a lot of COVID anxiety, fatigue, um, and 
uh, insecurity. Decisions needed to be made quicker and often under duress um, from the patient's perspective, from families, caregivers, nurses, and us as doctors, we needed to make a decision based on what we were seeing at the moment without help from the hospital. We needed to be nimble in the clinic to allow for scaling of procedures because there was more procedures we needed to find a way to do them in a timely fashion. There was a lot of wasted energy um, that went towards unwinding the paranoia and these conspiracy theories um, that were very pervasive and the patients really gravitated those. We had to spend some time to try to dispel them without arguing with the patients. But COVID um, allowed us to tighten up our protocols, that's for sure. And the adherence to guidelines um, and become very hyper uh, efficient was good. This We needed to do this in order to um, survive. So I thank you for uh, listening. Um, I could not do this without my team at work, which is my three nurses uh, on the right and Emily Bertrand, my executive assistant on the left. She runs the front end and runs the practice. The nurses um, really helped me realize my, my vision. Um, that's my team at work. This is my team at home, my wife and my beautiful children. I thank you so much for listening to me and I look forward to our uh, round table discussion. Well, thank you. Uh, th that was a, 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 an amazing uh, a set of talks and uh, one that I think will um, hopefully stimulate um, a, a fair few uh, questions. Um, I'd like to start off um, by asking both uh, uh, Professor Lazaro Martinez and uh, Edmonds uh, a couple of questions. And, and really, maybe both of you can comment on the things that you did well and the things that you did not do as well. And um, um, just to, in a, in a hospital setting, and I, in my talk, I, I spoke about efficiencies. And I think that in, in, in my world, um, in an outpatient setting, the efficiencies um, um, were uh, really, really important. And, I, and, and, and I'd like to hear from, uh, from the, our panelists uh, uh, what, what, what went on with them. Um, Professor Lazaro Martinez, you can go first. Sir. Oh, thanks, thanks, Doctor Meyer, for for your question. So, so I, I think that mainly we, we have two experiences. Uh, one during the lockdown when everybody uh, were at home, and another experience after the lockdown is quite different. But perhaps that we did well is to increase or to improve the communication with the well community. That means primary care, uh, community nurses, and especially patient and relative at home. I think that we learned that it's quite important to increase, uh, perhaps to improve the communication with community nurses and relatives and patients in order to give a very clear message on how to manage this kind of patient at home and how to maintain the patient in a better condition. I had the bad things was, especially during the lockdown, the, 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 the strong lockdown was the cancellation of our activity in the hospital because all the activities uh, belongs diabetic food was cancelled. It is what for us uh, very frustrated because we know that a lot of patient needs for special emergencies uh, during the lockdown, and we can see how the patient um, just came to the hospital and only received just uh, probably a minor amputation. And uh, we can do more for them. So this is the bad things. So after the lockdown. So uh, I think that uh, the main lesson uh, was try to combine our activities, how important it is to maintain this service open, regardless what is the bad condition with the pandemic and other problems with the national health system that we can have. And it's important to maintain this uh, level of attention, especially in diabetes food patients, because we don't know how long it could be this pandemic, and we don't know what the different ways we can get. So for the future, maintain open this service as an essential service for the for the future. Mm. Hey, Edmonds, yeah. Thank you. Uh, the greatest element, I think, of our work was the, the teamwork 
working between the primary and secondary care. Uh, we needed a, a focus of care. Uh, the NHS uh, in UK uh, stated that diabetic multidisciplinary clinics should stay open uh, and may need to go at uh, maximum capacity. So that really was a, a, a great boom to us. And we worked well. Uh, communication was another plus. Uh, telehealth in the sense of uh, 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 WhatsApp uh, and Pandos and, and Microsoft Teams. So we had a, a really very good communication. Uh, and as you've also implied, uh, Perry, uh, the foot clinic took on uh, more operating uh, procedures. Uh, we, we couldn't get, the hospital had to be protected. Uh, the, the beds had to be protected. Uh, there was a, a problem in the sense that uh, elective surgery uh, was reduced. Uh, although we did get emergency surgery uh, when, when we could. Uh, it also showed, I think, the expanded role of the podiatrist uh, prescribing antibiotics, linking in with community teams. Uh, so, so overall, I think the plus was the message of good communication and uh, increased activity uh, in certain patients. Um, I, I, you ask, what were the challenges? I, I, I think the dialysis patients were a great challenge. Uh, and uh, their, their, their morbidity and mortality uh, was significant in this uh, pandemic. Uh, but we've got them all vaccinated now, so I think they will be uh, uh, protected. But I think as we heard earlier today, it's the, re the renal, the dialysis patient who has the greatest risk of uh, morbidity and mortality. Uh, and just to finally say, uh, and, and this goes along, I think, with the information from Ontario earlier today, uh, our amputations did not fall. And recently, there's been a, a paper in Diabetes Care uh, of our national figures, and our national figures showed that the major amputations fell by 7%. Uh, now, that could be due to various causes, which we could discuss. Uh, but overall, I think the message is the, the, the team, both in uh, the clinic and the community, worked well. Well, I agree. And, and you know, the, the interesting thing about, you know, you were talking about the elective surgeries were canceled. So we had that all shut down. But it's funny how the diabetic foot that's potentially life threatening is regarded as an elective surgery. So this is a problem. I don't know if it's, it's like that in your centers. You have a little bit more sophistication with integration of the diabetic foot into the whole uh, healthcare system. Here, it's not so much. And so we are, um, you know, we're fighting for someone with an unstable, for, okay, we could argue that a stable gangrenous forefoot is stable, I guess. I don't know, you know, that, that's kind of a weird thing to, 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 to get your head around. But that's how they, they, they regarded those kinds of people as elective. And then their, their rationalization was they kicked them off the list. And so that's where, uh, you know, where we, we were stuck. Now, the, again, the, 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 the minor amputations, aside from the forefoots, we can kind of do, but we're doing them under duress and we're doing them at pace. So the pace that we had was far greater than what we had before. And we were already, we were already kind of pushing the limit those four foot amputations are not good. They're not fun to do in a in an outpatient setting. It's it's you gotta you gotta you gotta have your wits about you if you want to do that. And and the the selection of the patient. So my case that I that I, I I presented, he we couldn't have proceeded if that he hadn't slipped in and got revascularized. We just couldn't have done it. It would have been dangerous, you know. And um, so, anyways, it's it's an interesting uh, concept. Um, from um, the, the, the one thing that I, I, I did want to um, sort of touch on before we, before we got too far into this is the use of dressings. And I guess, you know, in, in this instance, I, we really should talk about TLC and OSF because it's such a weird kind of dressing. It's not the same as others. And in this instance, it really did lend itself to helping those that were essentially helpless. And, and perhaps you could, uh, uh, a comment on that. Uh, maybe Jose, you could start first, and then Michael, you could finish up. Um, 
I think that's an important thing. Uh, obviously, we are very grateful to Ergo um, for developing this, but it's good to talk about because I don't think that many people here on our side of the uh, of the pond really know about that and know about its very unique effect. So if you could talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. A very good question. And I think it's crucial. So I think it's quite important to remind that this is uh, the, the main important thing is to, to maintain the standard of care for this kind of patient. And remember the standard of care for local care is of floating and environment and an appropriate bunker, an appropriate local bunker based on uh, evidence and recommendation. One of the benefits of this kind of dressing or this kind of technology that is able to apply in any condition, and especially during this pandemic crisis, we can do or we can apply uh, at the clinic, at the hospital, at conscious patient and a primary care. And this is especially a very good because all the technologies is not able to, to transfer to the home of the patient or transfer to primary care, and it's only restricted on the hospital settings. So in this occasion, I think this is a very good tool and especially treating to send or to reinforce the important message for applying the standard of care and following the international recommendation. One of the main important things that I always uh, used to say is that we, if, if everybody wants to, to get the same result, the only way to get the same result in every part of the world is following the international recommendation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Time, time, time is tissue. And as long as an ulcer remains open, there is the risk of infection. And infection is not a non-emergency situation. Uh, as soon as you get infection, uh, you may have a streptococcal infection and the foot could be lost within 24, 48 hours. So every, every ulcer is an emergency. Uh, and, and infection is almost a hyper emergency. So you've got to try and get this ulcer healed as quickly as possible. Uh, and there is the, the, the evidence uh, that the healing is much quicker with ergostart uh, in the neuro ischemics as well um, as, as in a sense, neuropathic patients. So we've got the evidence that healing is quicker. And we've heard that the hospital procedures were less available. So therefore your neuro ischemic patient, uh, which might, who might have gone forward for an angioplasty uh, simply to get the ulcer healed as quickly as possible. Uh, uh, this may not have happened in the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, but therefore, but you've got to ergo start uh, improving the also healing by the evidence now that Jose has shown by increasing the uh, vascular uh, 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 situation. So uh, it, it's useful for getting the ulcer healing. You should not let the ulcer stay unhealed for as uh, long as you, you can. You've got to get it healed very, very quickly. So I have a, thank you. Um, the, the one, uh, two quick questions we've only got about um, um, we've only got a couple minutes here, but there's one, um, two, two things. Um, one uh, from Shivani is asking um, about this virtual multidisciplinary team. It's essentially making friends with all of your specialist colleagues, and you have to kind of do that over time so that they will take your call and they understand what you're doing. Because if you're uh, doing wound care and you're out in the community, they probably don't know a lot about that and they don't know what the diabetic foot is. So it's about teaching them a bit and about offering up your services and engaging with them. Um, and I think the last uh, question that I'd like to ask our panelists is, um, what, uh, so this is from uh, Ida Costa, um, what, do you, what, what do your team do, what do your teams do to engage patients in self-management of their wounds? And um, we'll get a, a brief one from each of you, um, a simple thing, one simple point for each of you. Um, oh, Jose. Oh, so I, I, I think it's quite important to engage of the patient. And the main uh, message is to keep clear the patient how important is his disease. So sometimes the patient is, uh, um, is so far 
about uh, how complicated is this disease and how it, or what is the, the the possible or the potential complication that they can or he can uh, um, um, develop in the future. So quite important for increased engage is try to inform the patient and to communicate the patient how important is this disease. This is not quite, this is not only an ulcer. And used to say always the same, diabetic food is not only an ulcer. An ulcer is just an episode of the natural history, but I it's agree. important. Mm -hmm. Michael, quickly. Just quickly, explain the importance and give our patients confidence, confidence in dealing with this, uh, I, I, with simple instructions uh, and, and to say it's not unconquerable. We can get them through this uh, if we work together. I agree. Well, listen, um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Lazaro Martinez and Professor uh, Edmonds. Um, we, this was an excellent uh, session. I think that we learned a lot. And uh, I, I, I need to thank Ergo Medical for uh, inviting us to speak and to share our experiences. It's been a tremendous, um, a tremendous experience. Um, at the end uh, of this session, please fill out the, um, um, the uh, feedback. And don't forget to talk about the session uh, on social media with the uh, hashtag, hashtag Wounds Canada 2021 or hashtag Best Foot Forward. Thank you so much. We look forward to next year. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.